Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Moldflow webinar. My name is Beth, and I'm going to be the moderator for Javier, who is going to be talking about cooling methods within Moldflow Insight Part 2. Throughout the whole presentation, please feel free to ask us questions along the way. We have a series of people in the background, including myself, um, Kristen, and Jay, who are all on the Moldflow team and ready to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and then what we also do is post this slide deck to the public folder uh, listed there, um, autodesk.box.com backslash Moldflow21 for you to be able to download. We will also post this webinar to YouTube afterwards as well. And again, there's the question box. So please feel free to ask us any questions throughout the course of this webinar. So just before we get into the content of the webinar, I wanted to quickly go over some of the upcoming topics that we will be having webinars on. They are understanding warpage and shrinkage and then utilizing boundary conditions. Uh, some of the past webinars we have done are on topics such as uh, what's new in Moldflow 2017 R2 and also the cooling methods, um, the first part. Again, if you're ever curious about any of these past webinars, uh, like I mentioned, this webinar recording will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is the Autodesk Sim 360 page, and it will be listed under the Build Your Simulation IQ section. And if you receive this invite for the webinar from a colleague, you can always go to our forums or any of the other options listed there to sign up for yourself. And that way it will be a series listed on your email and you will be able to easily join um, the ones that you would like to attend. And a quick summary we like to have for those of you who are not familiar with our knowledge website. Um, we do have a website that the support team creates and writes articles on based on the topics that um, our users are coming to us with. So please feel free to explore some of the recent articles that are listed there. You can also go to the Moldflow Insight Troubleshooting article page that has a list of the articles we have published. And moving on to the service packs and hotfixes, um, we do like to try to remind everyone to keep their product up to date. Uh, Moldflow 2017 R2 was made available um, on October 26th. And if you are still using Moldflow 2017, there is an updated job manager, uh, which is 6.1, that is um, available and listed on the forums as well. And um, moving forward, I would like to go ahead and pass uh, this over to Javier. Thanks, Beth, and welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. So the agenda for today is mainly split in three different topics. So we will start uh, talking about conformal cooling analysis, which are using CFD solvers at the background. Uh, then we will move forward to rapid heating and cooling analysis, and we will finish with a hot runner and cut cartridge heater controls. Um, I will show you in a small live demo how to set up a rapid heating cooling analysis uh, where I will also define a heater simulating a, a hot runner. But before we start I would like Beth to, to bring the poll here because every single topic in, in this webinar could be like a webinar in its own. So the idea of this poll is to let us know if you have a special interest in any of these topics and if we find like a main trend we could uh, think in creating a future webinar just on this topic. So please Beth if you could uh, bring the poll. The poll is up now. And the questions are, which of the following topics are you most interested in learning about? All right, we have about 77% um, have voted. Give it a couple more moments here. All 
All right. So let's see what your um, what our results are here. All right, it looks like 38% uh, of you would like to see conformal cooling um, with CFD, 24% uh, rapid heating and cooling analysis, and 38% hot runner and cartridge heater controls. Okay, so then it seems it's quite distributed like 113 <laughs> every topic, so that would make us a lot of work for future. <laughs> okay, so before to start with the content of uh, today's webinar, uh, I would like to make a, a summary of what we saw on the, on the first part of this, um, let's say, collection of two webinars uh, on the topic of cooling. On, on the first uh, webinar, we saw the main differences between the two main um, simulation approaches, so the cool BIM, which is a very flexible and light method to, to that allow us to optimize the, the cooling analysis. So because we are working with a boundary element method, we are not meshing the inside of our tool, and that allows us to move very easily the channel of the cooling system to simulate Sorry, to simulate <clears throat> to simulate uh, different um, scenarios. Um, the limitation on this uh, boundary element method is that we are only able to run steady state analysis. On the other side, we have uh, cool FEM, uh, which is uh, could compromise it in speed and accuracy and allow us uh, steady state analysis and transient analysis within the cycle of from startup. This uh, finite element methods is the basic technology for almost what almost everything what we are going to see today and allow us to mesh uh, and to import direct uh, mole cut geometry into uh, mole flow. So starting with the first topic uh, of today is a conformal cooling analysis. So the main aim of uh, uh, cooling analysis is to achieve a uniform temperature on the surface of the cavity. This uh, uniform temperature uh, results in better quality parts and shorter cycles. So traditionally these kind of cooling systems are made by drilling holes inside the plate and in some time, sometimes in inserts, uh, we are introducing baffles and bubbles, which allow us to go to move vertically inside of the tool. So conformal cooling analysis allow us, in you know, difference with the drilling approach, to get very close to the geometry and to reach with uh, coolant every single corner on our parts. But how we could do this, uh, this kind of uh, labyrinth or these cooling systems? Uh, this is not able to do it by traditional uh, manufacturing. So here, the direct metal laser sintering is in use. It's this additive manufacturing based on a, on a, on a CAD uh, geometry. We are able to create this kind of complex uh, cooling systems, and once printed, once created, we could assemble this insert directly into the mold. This kind of new technology does not affect our cycle or our uh, simulation. It's just the map of temperatures on the cavity will be different, and probably, or oh, that's the goal, will be more uniform through the uh, surface of the cavity. Um, because this kind of technology requires from a 3D mesh, um, these kind of elements are still um, accessed by drilling holes, and this kind of uh, holes we recommend to do it still by uh, beam elements. It's not the, the only uh, application, but uh, we see a lot, uh, a lot of usage of this uh, formal cooling for rapid and heating cooling methods of analysis. So, but 
this new technology means sometimes new new problems, yes, and the the idea of having big voids in our uh, cooling channel means that uh, we could create stagnant flow. That means that as we could see in this velocity picture on the right top, uh, flow will the, the flow the coolant will try to to find the easiest way to reach uh, the outlet uh, from the inlet. So that means that we could find out that our system has uh, a very poor heat removal, and that will create uh, uneven power cooling. Of course, this kind of uneven power cooling will create uh, power quality parts. So. At the end, we are accessing a new technology which allows us a lot of things, but we are getting worse results. So, to fix this um, this problem, um, the design of this kind of cooling system should be made in conjunction with the simulation. Because we have here a real 3D flow analysis, we could not stay with our beam technology, and we need something in 3D in 3D simulation. So, this kind of solvers are called computational fluid dynamics, so the CFD. There are a bunch of commercial codes that uh, uh, are out, out there in the, in the market for many years. And this technology is in, in incorporated in mole flow, and we could simulate that. In this case, uh, instead of uh, importing the axis of the of the drilled holes, we need the full 3, uh, 3D geometry of the channel. Also, because we are introducing a 3D geometry, we have uh, special uh, requirements. So, the main uh, the main parameter that we have to take uh, into account is these enhancement layers. So, the fluid in 3D will uh, be affected by the boundary layers. So you could see in this picture of the pipe where we have like uh, three or more uh, elements on on the surface. This surface is where the interaction of the fluid with the tool is happening, and we need to have this uh, mesh really well defined. You could see in the settings of the machine here at the bottom, this enhancement layers by default is set to 3. If we see that the simulation is not capturing the real uh, heating, so we will need to increase. Um, we have new um, boundary conditions because uh, here we are not just defining the flow rate and the and the coolant. We will need to define an inlet boundary condition and an outlet boundary condition. In the inlet boundary condition, we define also the flow rate and the temperature. And by default, in the outlet boundary condition, the zero pressure is defined automatically. So, summarizing a little bit of everything in conformal cooling, we could say that conformal cooling is an ideal technology, but not only for rapid heating and cooling methods. That the conformal cooling solver um, should not be used, if possible, for uh, drilled channels, because the use of this CFD technology, where we are simulating the 3D behavior of the flow, will uh, slow down a lot our simulation. So, for just uh, drilled channels, we saw a slowdown of about four times, and even if we are modeling uh, the corners of our drilled connections, this could be down even ten times. So, the main idea is if we are still drilling our tool to make the cooling analysis, we still stay with the one-dimensional beam technology. Okay, and so Javier, maybe one quick question um, related yeah, sure. to conformal cooling. Uh, we have a user who would like to know if meshing of the conformal channels are the defaults um, sufficient? Yes, yes. So the the, the thing of this um, enhancement layers is uh, what in in CFD is called the uh, Y plus. So it's a parameter from the boundary layer that should be captured on these layers. Of course, here depends also on the size of this pipe. So, once more, if it's, it's a pipe or a, a drilled uh, hole, 
uh, I will not recommend to use this technology, yes? But usually by these three layers should be enough, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Javier. Of course, more layers will be welcome, but uh, as in every simulation, more layers means more elements and more, more computational time. So we need to find a, a, a middle way, yeah, so that we have enough layers, but uh, we don't spend here three days for calculating this. Okay, so then let's move to rapid heating and cooling analysis. So the idea of uh, rapid heating and cooling analysis is that we have a high mole surface during the filling time and a low mole temperature during the packing and cooling phases. This um, ends up in a high gloss surface, so here um, probably you already see these two pictures. Um, we have the compression of the same part, produce it as normal um, process and with rapid heat and cooling. The surface, the aesthetics is much better with this kind of technology. Therefore, it's um, quite used uh, in the automotive and usually this uh, technology is just put it on the fixed plate, so the side of the part that should have this high gloss surface. Uh, also benefits, it's uh, well for cosmetic parts, it's uh, nicer, it's glossier, so that's the, the main advantage of this technology. So for cooling, yeah, so we stay on the same technology. We have different coolants uh, with different temperatures, but uh, for the heating, we have different methods. The most used is saturated steam. We have also electric cartridges, and less use is pressurized hot water and electrical induction. That does not mean that it's not used, but not so often as the other two. So what we are going to concentrate in this uh, overview of uh, rapid heating and cooling technologies in the saturated beam. So in, in this kind of process, usually the same cooling channel is used for heating and cooling the tool. So Therefore, we need uh, what is called a two perk uh, stages where we are just cleaning the cooling circuit from steam or from water. Usually, it's uh, air which is just uh, blowing in and is cleaning somehow the, the tool. Actually, because we are using steam and, and usually water for the cooling, that's not a, a main problem. So here we will have like um, a new cycle which will be running parallel to the injection uh, cycle one. We will see right now. But here on this screenshot of the of the controller, we could see that now we have four different stages that we need to define. We have a heating that could be controlled by time or by temperature. Then we need to clean this uh, circuit by a primary purge. This has a, a time uh, a duration in time. Then we are cooling uh, with water. We could also define by time or by temperature. And we have a second purge that is cleaning from this water and started again with the heating. So if we take a look on what is happening inside of the cavity, let's call it injection cycle. Yeah? We know we start with a fill just before uh, finish the fill, like 98%, usually we start with the pack, and after the pack, we start with the cool. After we finish the cool, we open the mold, we take out the part, and that's it. So for the standard cooling analysis, we have all these defined, so the fill, pack, and cool define it as a single parameter, where we define how long should that take. And then we have a second parameter, which is the mole open time, which is defining how long it takes the, to the machine to open the tool and to extract the part. If we run a, a cool FEM, we have a, an extra step, which we could call it like a weight close. So we have this parameter here, so this mole close time before injection, that means 
we could of course define it at zero, but this means that after we open the mole, we close it, and before to inject the new, or to start the new cycle, we just wait a time. And this time is the time that we are going to use to heat up our tool. So if we compare this, what is happening inside of the cavity, with what is happening inside of the channel on the rapid heating and cooling channel, we'll see there are some differences. So the first thing is how we synchronize these two cycles. And this synchronization is always happening at the end of the cool. So at the end of the cool, uh, we'll start to count the open time. So this time that we define it to open, extract the part, and to close it again. At this point in time, uh, mole flow will synchronize with a second purge. Depending on the on the length of this second purge, uh, will take lower, uh, longer or shorter than the open stage or yeah, step. After this, uh, we will start with the heating. We define it by time. Could be that it's defined it by temperature. If we know the time, we know how long it will take. Usually, this heating is also uh, still happening during the first seconds of the of the filling analysis. After this comes the first purge, also depending on the time, could be somehow synchronized with the end of the pack or not. And then we have a cool. And here maybe the question is, uh, what is the difference between the two cools? Yeah? And the first cool on the cavity is what we define it as remaining time inside of this fill pack and cool. And what we see down in the cool is the time that we are um, pumping the coolant uh, on our uh, uh, channel. Okay, that could be different. Also important here is that the synchronization is always happening at the end of the cool. And the second point is, if we take into account the different times, because we have a field pack time, a uh, field pack cool time plus open mole plus weight mode close, this of course could be different than uh, the cool heating and the two purges. So in such a case, mole flow will always take the longer cycle. So if the rapid heating and cooling cycle is longer, because we define it instead of time by temperature, the full cycle of the injection will be also extended. Okay, so summarizing a little bit this rapid and heating technology. So what we are doing is we are uh, heating up our um, cavity. There are different methods to do this. Um, the most popular is maybe saturated steam, but could be by electric cartridges, by pressurized hot water, or by electrical induction. This kind of part has better surface finishes and stronger weld lines because this uh, weld is happening at a higher temperature. And for simulate, um, we need to design the, the cooling channels, optimize the process, and be careful with the synchronization of both cycles, let's say like this. So let's move to the third uh, topic uh, today, so the hot runners and cartridge heat controls. So as you probably know, um, hot Javier, runners... Javier, yes? uh, excuse, sorry for uh, interrupting yeah. you. Uh, we just had a comment that um, we cannot see your screen. Um, I just wanted to make sure you are you're still sharing. You could not see. You could not see my we screen. We have a user who cannot see your screen, um, but it looks like you're still sharing. So let's. Um, okay. Yes. I think we're good. Let's it's it's, a, it's any question going. about this rapid heating and cooling? Just okay. Um, nope. I think we're good. It looks like the majority can see what you're sharing. So um, I'll see if I can work on the behind the scenes to figure out what's going on with that user. So, all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. Sorry about that. No, no, no worries. Okay, so um, hot runners. So you probably know the hot runners, hot nozzles. Um, all these devices are really complex. They have a lot of parts, isolators, not isolators, uh, heaters. Um, 
to model exactly these kind of elements, it's quite difficult. So it, it's possible. So actually, we have here a screenshot of one of uh, one hot nozzle that we were simulating, and it's possible. But I think for this uh, hot nozzle, we have like. I don't know, it was like eight different parts with different materials and thermal properties and things like that. So our recommendation is, if possible, try to merge uh, similar materials and, or parts with similar materials and thermal properties directly on the CAD system and to import this um, hot runner as simple as possible because having different parts and meshing independently will not increase the accuracy of the, of the simulation unless they are different, of course. So how we define the boundary conditions in, in, in such a way? So this is a, a real um, simulation that we were running. So first, for the mall, we define a mall block 3D like we were doing on the last webinar. Then we have the hot runner manifold. This we assign to the mole insert properties. We define the materials, thermal conductivity, etc. Then we have a heater element that we define with the property heater 3D. And then here we have different uh, uh, heater controls. So we are going to discuss this based on cartridges, but mainly is the same. In this case, um, this heater is uh, with a constant temperature of 220, but could be assigned to time dependent or temperature dependent. And then we have our polymer. So in this sense, we need to change the property. Usually it's defined like uh, the temperature on the hot runner, but if we want to simulate the influence of the heater, into the hot runner, we need to change this and use it like a heater element. That means that we are going to transfer the energy from the heater into the um, polymer, and we could track this uh, during the uh, transient uh, simulation. That is actually something that we could do. So we could simulate as well the startup of one um, hot runner. This is mainly when we are um, changing the, the value of the temperature on the, on the hot uh, runner. So if we are using this kind of time control where we are switching on and off, then will make sense. If we are just defining temperature as constant, 220, the value through the different cycles will be constant. So talking about cartridge, so these different uh, heater controls. So we have five different controls, the constant flux, we define the flux energy that is uh, created or introduced by the heater, uh, by, the, yeah, by the heater. We could define a constant temperature which is not changing over time. The first one which we are going to see now is a time control. In this sense, uh, we have the flux, which is going to be introduced in the system through a different, so for a period of time. And here it's a little bit tricky because if you see in the screenshot, uh, first we have switch off time and then switch on time. So it's not that we are starting and uh, switching on and then off, but from the very beginning, from the beginning of the cycle, the cartridge is uh, introducing this energy into the system. You could see here in this in this chart, uh, we define it a time off at one second. So from zero till one, we are introducing this uh, 5,000 watts per square meter. We are doing a break until the second tenth, and then we are giving a, a once more this energy until the process is finished, until the cycle is finished. Then we have also the option of uh, defining this based on a thermocouple that probably is the most real scenario. Uh, and in this case, we could define a threshold temperature. So we could define a switch off and switch on temperature. And if there is a minimum of time or 
a delay. In that sense, we could see, for example, in this screenshot that we define it a maximum temperature of 85 and a minimum temperature of 80. And we could see in the chart how the temperature is moving up and down, just keeping the value of the temperature uh, constant or inside of this threshold. And then we have um, time and target temperature base uh, for FTC. In this sense, what we are doing is we are defining um, the switch off and on time, and then how we want to control this. And in this uh, control, we could also define delay the time until we reach this temperature. So in this case, you should be um, careful because it could be that because we are not reaching the temperature, our cycle is getting really too long. And then it's not because of the cooling of the part, but it's because the cartridge or the heating system is not reaching the desired temperature. And then let's uh, move to the, to the live demo. And Javier, we have a couple more questions now, real quick, if that's all right with you. Okay, yes. Um, so uh, we have a user who would like to know if there is a meshing guideline for hot nozzles um, and that it, it looked a lot finer than the usual mes meshes. If it's a guideline, how to mesh hot runners? Uh, yes, if there's any guideline for, for, meshing, the hot, uh, for meshing the hot nozzles. No. So not guideline, not that uh, I know. So our recommendation is, of course, to try to reduce the amount of parts. Uh, for example, this um, um, hot runner or this nozzle that I show you in, on the first slide in, in hot runners, I downloaded it from Mastip. There are some other providers, so Husky, Husco, etc. I know, for example, that uh, Mastip is uh, uploading this um, uh, cut files on the website, and you could download it. These are already reduced, but maybe in a, in a too extreme because they, they don't provide you with the, with the heater. So that will be more for a maybe cut geometry than for a simulation. But I will say something like that will be like, let's say, the optimum. So if the parts are the same, the same material, the same thermal properties, I will say merge it and use the same uh, meshing process for this for the full hot runner and not to mesh every single part because by sure will take a, a little bit longer and it's not going to to bring much uh, more information okay great thank you and uh, one additional question at this time um so does the rapid heating and cooling analysis reduce warpage yeah, that's that's one of the goals also from for this. So because we are uh, injecting the material a higher temperature, the um, the plastic reaches all the cavity in a higher value or in a higher temperature value. That means that um, the gradient of temperatures is more constant all over the part, and somehow we could reduce also the warpage. But um, it's because of that. So because we are uh, injecting uh, the cavity is hotter, the plastic is not getting cool so fast, and therefore we are getting better warpage results. But yeah, so I will not say it's the, the main uh, goal for this kind of technology, but it's also like that, yes. OK. Great. And um, a quick follow-up question. Um, do you see the warp change in mold flow um, with rapid heating and rapid cooling uh, versus without in mold flow? Well, I never try by myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess also. Um, yes, yeah, so at the end, so we are calculating this uh, strain state from, from the part and Based on that, as the temperature, the, the cooling is more uniform, I will expect that we could see that, yes. But um, by myself, I have no experience okay. with that. OK. OK, so then um, I prepared this, um, this uh, single, uh, this simple uh, simulation. So it's a uh, plate. 
and I model two cooling uh, channels. So it's very simple. I have also the already the um, the tool. So I already mesh everything, and I will provide. We we will uh, upload this file also on the on the out of this box, so you could also download it and and play around after that. So the idea is that uh, we have uh, two channels and we have a hot nozzle with a heater. So the idea is how we set up this. So maybe let's start with the um, with a hot runner. So first we need to control that the properties on the nozzle are used as heater element. We are not defined at constant flux or uh, defined it by um, fixed uh, constant temperature. We want to see the influence of the heater on, on, on this nozzle. So this was okay. And then we go for the heater. So in this case it's a heater. And here define it in this case is um a rating, yeah. So uh, uh, this is new and was new in release two. So before usually you should define um, bats per square meter. That was pretty difficult to calculate because you need to know probably based on the cut geometry how long or it's so how big is your heater to define which are the amount of bats per square unit. So in since the release two, we have the option to define it just like uh, power. So I know this uh, heater uh, it's consuming 0 0.1 kilowatts. That's it. So more flow will take care of distributing this energy through the whole heater. So no changes here. And now uh, we will move to define the rapid heating and cooling. So. Usually, um, if you are working in the automotive uh, wall, you will be interested in having one of the sides of your part with this nice uh, finishing. So usually, just one of the two channels are defined as rapid heating and cooling. If you are doing transparent parts or things like that, then probably you will define it in both channels. In this case, I'm going just to define it in the upper channel. So for the bottom channel, I will just define, as we were doing always, like a coolant inlet here. We will edit, and I will define 35 degrees. OK, that's it. OK, and for the um, rapid heating cooling is the same kind of channel, but we are defining a new control that we have here, rapid heating and cooling inlets. We define it also here, and we edit. So, well, may maybe before to, to define this, let's go to the standard properties to define the, the process, and based on the process and when we know how long this should be, then we could define the heating and the approach stages. So let's close this. Let's move to the process settings. And here's where we have everything. So we are going to define a 15 second cycle for the injection packing and cooling time. After that, we are going to define a mole open time of five seconds. So is the time that the machine will need to open the tool, take out the, the finished part, and to close again. And we are going to stay close 14 seconds, just heating up. Uh, in this sense, we have a cycle of 34 seconds. Uh, just to be consistent, we will try to keep the same length on the rapid heating and cooling. As I said, if we are doing differently, more flow will take the longer cycle. We say OK, and then we could go back and to modify the values here. So we are going to use the time control, and for this we are going to define a heating stage of 16. Well, 
I started here because I, I know already the values, but probably you will start on the synchronization point. So we know that after the cycle, which we define it as 15 seconds, we are going to start with a purge, with the second one. So in this case, I will define a four seconds purge. So that means that from the five seconds that the machine is going to need to open, extract the part and close it again, only four seconds is going to be used for this purge. Then we will go to the top again. So this 16 seconds means that after these four seconds, we have still one second and 15 seconds for the heating up. As we define it, 14 seconds for the close, uh, weight close, we are going to jump one second on the injection process. That's okay. Then we are in the primary air perch. In this sense, I'm going, I'm going to reduce it to two of two seconds. And then for the cooling, I will define at the same cooling temperature of 35 uh, degrees. And because I know that my complete um, cycle is taking 34 seconds, I will update this uh, time for uh, 12 seconds. Now if I did the maths right, both cycles are taking 34 seconds. Okay, because the simulation takes a while, I already prepare uh, the, I already run the simulation, I have here the results. So it's just the same with the same parameters we already defined, but with the solution already there. So the first thing I, I want to see is uh, how the temperature on the tool is changing based on the heater and based on the rapid heating and cooling analysis. So Therefore, I'm interested in uh, showing the temperature mold transient. For that, I will need the tool tetras. And then I could just move to this temperature mold. And I will uh, split uh, the tool just to see what is happening inside. Okay, we could see that the heater is affecting, so it's warming up this part of the of the hot runner. And let's run this and see. Let's do it in a loop. We could see like uh, when we are cooling, uh, blue color is on, mainly focused on the channels, and when we are changing, uh, the, the, this part of the tool is getting more hotter. Okay, so we could see like uh, this uh, evolution during the time based on the on the uh, heating system and on the rapid cooling system. So let's stop this and let's have a look uh, inside of uh, this tool based on a X Y plot. We could just uh, uncheck this close and then I will create a new plot which is again the same plot so the temperature mold transient but I will select the XY plot. Now here we need the, the nodes which should be placed on the tool to see how the temperature is evolving uh, through the time. So in that sense I already searched for three nodes that uh, we could uh, see now. The first one is a node close to the rapid heating channel. Okay, let's move this. Okay, we could see here at the second 15, it's at the end of our cooling step. We are uh, purging, so there is no anymore the cooling of our coolant at 35 degrees. Because we have still the, the heater, we could see how the temperature is rising, not because the perch is heating up, but because of the of the heater. After four seconds, that will be like second 19, we start to heat up uh, with this saturated steam, and we are taking 16 seconds, so we are 
doing all the way and we still have one second at the beginning of the cycle. Then we are starting with the first purge which is decreasing the temperature. Again, not because the purge itself but because we are not uh, pumping in steam so the temperature is decreasing and after these two seconds we are starting to pump the coolant so the temperature is dropping quite fast and uh, going down almost 35 degrees. Okay, this is a node very close to the channel. This is more or less what we were expecting. So let's see another node, for example, close to the heater. So that will be 11744. Obviously in this case uh, we define it constant temperature through the complete cycle, so we could see here if we move this. Like the heat, so the heater is keeping constant through the whole cycle, so no surprise on this is what we were expecting. And then let's have a look on the last node which is close to the surface of this part, that will be 211904. Yeah, so what we see here is that the cavity is of course not constant but it's quite smooth and that's probably what we were uh, searching so that we have a higher temperature when we are in, uh, injecting but then we could just take it away. And remember this value on the temperature is on the tool and not is, is not the temperature of our part or, or the plastic. So. Um, even though this value is under the um, transient temperature so we could extract the part but once more this is not the temperature on the part it's just one node inside from the surface of the cavity and that's it so let's go back to our presentation summary so we see three different technologies today for the conformal cooling channel. We see that we could follow quite precisely the geometry of our part, allowing us to reach with the coolant all the corners of our uh, part. Uh, this has uh, some risk and it's because of the, we could have some hollow voids which may result in a stagnant flow which will create a poor heat removal and this is uh, creating an uneven part cooling which is not uh, something that something decided. For do this we integrate in the simulation process a CFD solver which is able to simulate the coolant flow inside of the channel in a 3D way and because of this uh, new mesh that should be calculated by the CFD, this process is taking time. So unless we have really a very complex geometry, um, this kind of technology is not recommended because if we only have a drilled channel, the best technology is still to remain on 1D beams. Then we saw a little bit of wrapping, heating and cooling and we saw that this technology uh, improved the well line strength and aesthetics and it could even also reduce the warp of our parts. The most used uh, heating system is saturated steam and then we have two different cycles that we need to synchronize and this synchronization is happening at the end of the cooling stage and at the end of this cooling stage is starting the mole open time and the second purge and from here mole flow will synchronize both cycles. And finally for hot runners, um, if we have a full detailed hot runner we need, it's recommended directly on the CAD system to merge different parts that has similar materials and thermal properties just to improve the meshing and the idea of setting this hot runner uh, plastic as um, 
depending on the heater, will allow us to see transient uh, simulations or evolutions on the temperature on the hot runner through different cycles. And that's it. Um, I don't know, Beth, if there's any other question. Hi. Yes, we do have one more question at this time um, around the rapid heating and rapid cooling analysis. Um, our user would like to know for the mold close time before inject, uh, can this be defined as a desired surface temperature? Um, sorry again. So if, if the temperature, yeah, so, so if the temperature of the heating uh, stage should be the same that the plastic material. Okay. Yeah. Is that the question? That is, yes. Yeah. So, so basically, um, for the mold close time before injection, um, can this be defined as a desired surface temperature? Yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's when one customer told me once. So, um, it will be everything much easier if we were injecting water. Um, of course, if we will reach uh, the surface of the cavity as the melt uh, temperature of the plastic, that will be perfect, yeah? But probably that will take longer. And so at the, at the end, we, at the end of the day, we need to produce parts, yes? And of course, if, if uh, we have the technology for heating up so until 200, 240, and we have time enough to wait till the cycle is reaching these temperatures, yeah, why not? So that will be perfect, yeah? But, I don't see if that will be very feasible. Okay, great, thank you. And at that time, um, it does not look like there are any other questions. Um, so I think we are good. Okay, then as always, thank, thank you for uh, yeah, attending and to save a little bit of time for our webinar. We have different uh, additional resources that you could reach. Um, besides this uh, online help, Sim Studio, uh, Sim Hub Autodesk, Autodesk Network Net Network. I will also strongly recommend the new videos from the last Autodesk University. Um, there are some very interesting uh, topics that, um, well, are really very well presented. It's taking one hour just on specific uh, topics. So I will strongly recommend that you take a look on the new videos of this last Autodesk University. And yeah, that's it. So if there is any other question, we could uh, stop here. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending.